Welcome to Farm Food Facts. Today, one of the most important topics that we can address, the transition to a net zero economy through biofuel. Our guest is Jeff Bruin, the founder and CEO of POET, the world's largest producer of biofuels and bioproducts. He's a recognized innovator, entrepreneur, agriculturist, philanthropist, and advocate for the biofuels industry. Poet currently operates 33 bioprocessing plants with a combined annual production capacity of 3 billion gallons of bioethanol, reducing carbon emissions and improving air quality nationwide. Poet, congratulations, was named to Fortune's 2019 Change the World list and recognized as one of Fast Company's most innovative companies of 2019. For more than 30 years, Jeff has played a critical role in producing renewable biofuels and bioproducts to address the national and global issues that surround agriculture, health, and climate change. He was a founding member of Growth Energy, the country's largest biofuels trade association, and led the group for 10 years. He's received notable recognitions, including BIO's George Washington Carver Award, and the Global Bioeconomy Leadership Award and an Honorary Doctorate of Public Service from South Dakota State University. Jeff, it is really a pleasure to welcome you to Farm Food Facts today. Thanks, Phil, glad to be here. So I know you're a true champion for global agriculture. What's your utmost goal for agriculture? Well, I, uh, having grown up on a farm, uh, I think that uh, agriculture is a, a key component to really everything that, that, that we face in life. Uh, and it's certainly the way we eat. And I think also in the future going to be a, a critical component in the way we fuel almost everything on the planet. Um, so, you know, we want to see ag be successful uh, and we want to see ag really power the world. And that's a big goal, but that's really uh, what I think about every day. It's a huge goal. And, you know, we're all behind you 100%. Um, I guess I've got to ask, though, what's unique to biofuels that can enable the transition to a low carbon economy against the backdrop of other, quote unquote, clean energy alternatives? Well, you know, agriculture is really uh, provided by God. We've got the sun, the soil and the seed. And uh, quite frankly, everything uh, in agriculture can be in sync with nature. Uh, the only problem today with biofuels that doesn't make us completely in sync with nature is that we're still using petroleum to power trucks and tractors. We're still using petroleum-based fertilizers and chemicals. But quite frankly, if you really look at biofuels uh, longer term, they can be completely in sync with nature. Today, we're 46% better um, than, uh, than gasoline and carbon emissions. So we're already almost 50% better. Uh, but in the future, we can be 100% better. So that's where we're heading. So I've got to ask you, because trucking is certainly an issue, uh, both for the environment as well as the labor force. Um, you know, when, when I pump gas um, into my car, there's a little sticker, you know, on the gas pump that says that it contains, uh, you know, 10% ethanol. If in fact, ethanol is so much better as a biofuel than petroleum, why is that number at 10% instead of 50% or 100%? Well, of course, there are other blends out there you can buy and you can buy a flex fuel vehicle, but really that's, uh, that's been our long-term battle with the oil industry. Uh, they obviously have a, a very big stake in maintaining market share, uh, in, 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 in keeping the percentage of, of gasoline in the tank very high because it keeps their profits very high. And so uh, it has been a 33-year battle for me uh, trying to get us to 15% ethanol. Just the 10 to 15% battle is now 12 years old uh, and we are still battling every day in Washington and in the States against the oil industry. They do not want to give up the gas tank and ag needs to get more of the gas tank. So it's, it's, it's a bit of a war. And not only does ag need to get more, but the environment needs to get more as well. Um, if, if we went from 10 to 15% ethanol um, in, our, in our fuel for our cars, what would the effect be? Uh, it would significant, re significantly reduce tailpipe emissions. Uh, it would reduce greenhouse gases uh, in, in the environment. Um, it would lower the cost of gasoline for consumers. Uh, so they win. Uh, it's a win-win-win. The only negative really is for the oil industry losing market share. 
and becoming oversupplied and hurting their profitability. So it's, there are no negatives to doing it. Um, you know, uh, the oil industry is the, is the big hang up. So what do people um, don't, what, what do people not know about biofuels? What are those misconceptions um, that you'd like them to understand? Well, number one is they don't know it's good for their car. You know, I think there's been a lot of false information put out there on purpose uh, by our competition, but they don't know that it's uh, that it's good for their car. I mean, higher blend, I'm running E30 in every vehicle I have that's a non-flex fuel. It works fantastic. I mean, it's there's all these misconceptions that it's some, it's some bad component in gasoline. Well, actually, it's the best component in gasoline. And it's it's clean burning, it's higher octane, it's it's basically 200 proof vodka. Uh, it's it's not bad, and and so I think that's the number one conception. You look at Brazil; they're running uh, up to thirty percent ethanol in the same car as we have. Works fantastic. So I think that's maybe the number one conception. Number two is that somehow we're competing with food. In actuality, we're using the starch component um, of of the corn kernel, which is really a waste product. That's why it's very cheap. There's plenty of starch on the planet, and all the good parts, the protein, oil, and micronutrients, go to other things, uh, and most of it right back into the food supply. And so, um, you know, we're not affecting the food supply. In fact, the corn for ethanol would never be grown. And so we're enhancing the food supply by creating a market for the starch. We create the byproduct, which, which is protein that would never be grown. Uh, back in the eighties, when I was a kid on the farm, we set aside land for the U S government. 20% of our land was producing nothing and being paid by the government to do that today that produces fuel from the starch. And of course the protein oil and micronutrients, which is ac- extra food that wouldn't be produced that goes all over the world. So leading this fabulous company um, with 33 processing facilities, how are you finding ways to solidify biofuels place as a viable climate solution? Well, without question, we are uh, probably the best near-term solution to climate change. We're already here. We run in the cars that are out there. Um, We can produce more. Uh, agriculture growing all over the planet. And so we are, we are a very good solution that's here today and can make an impact um, immediately. So, um, so, so we're, te- we're telling that story, obviously. We're talking about 46% less greenhouse gas emissions. We're saying we can get much better very quickly. Uh, we're helping farmers to get cleaner as well and trying to, trying to work on ways we can help farmers get cleaner and, and, and lower carbon emissions. And uh, so I, I think we're telling the story everywhere we possibly can. Now, of course, the, the com- competition's out there telling all kinds of lies and falsehoods and putting all kinds of things out. There's had a huge battle in Indiana where the oil industry came at uh, agriculture with lots of lies about biofuels. And we turned it around, got the governor to veto the bill, but it's, it's just a constant battle getting the truth out. I'm a big believer that truth will prevail, but you've got to fight the battle and get the truth out. So what can farmers and ranchers and consumers and supermarkets and everybody else do to help you reinforce this, this message? I think first, you know, buy the product. So buy the highest blend of ethanol you can Uh, ask for a flex vehicle at your, at your dealer and blend 30 or 50 Buy 30 or 50 or 85% ethanol. If you're a true believer, or if you're just driving a regular car, put, put 15% in it or unleaded 88 in it. Uh, when you can, but tell your neighbors and your friends, tell them that, that bioethanol is a good product. Um, it's a great product and it's a product that, uh, that can replace gasoline and you can buy it today and really change your tailpipe emissions, not just helping uh, lower the carbon, but just for your family. I mean, you're pumping less toxic emissions into your car so you're not breathing them. You've got less toxic emissions coming on the tailpipe. If you're in your garage or your kids are standing by the tailpipe, you're, you're putting a cleaner product in the environment, not just for the world, but for your own family. Excellent point. Um, who else is involved uh, closely in the biofuel supply chain? Uh, you know, um, there are many players. So the oil companies are, are big buyers and blenders of ethanol. The convenience store companies are big buyers and blenders of ethanol. Um, you know, every retail outlet in the country touches, uh, you know, the blends. So it's really, um, it's really a large uh, group of, of, of companies all over the country and all over the world uh, that, that really have a part in the supply chain. What what are the checks and balances uh, or the touch points that you have um, to ensure the, that biofuel is sustainable um, and is, is trying to reach those goals that you're talking about? 
Well, you know, one of the things we're working on, obviously the farmer is part of the supply chain as well, agriculture. And so we're, we're going back to uh, agriculture. And um, one of the things we've worked on here is we've helped to create something called gradable, which is uh, a way to track the carbon intensity of farming. And long-term consumers in states that are big backers of, of low carbon fuel standards actually pay more for cleaner gasoline in those states. And some of that uh, incentive at some point, we hope will come back all the way back to the farm. So the farmer farms cleaner, so a lower carbon intensity, there actually could be a financial reward in the future through, through uh, processes or, or through um, uh, tracking mechanisms like gradable and others. There are others in the market as well. So I think what you're gonna see in the future is this push toward low carbon in every part of the economy. And part of that will be agriculture. Part of that will be our industry. We're working on becoming lower carbon every day. Part of that will be anyone else in the supply chain. Uh, that, that to, because the lower carbon you can make a product in states with low carbon fuel standards, they'll pay a higher price for it. And last questions. Um, let's go back to the farm that, that you just mentioned. How do biofuels contribute to their vibrancy? Well, without question, you know, today 40% of the corn crop is processed at an ethanol plant. Now, of course, the byproduct goes back into the food market. But without that market, uh, we'd have a huge issue. So back in the 1980s, when I was a teenager on the farm, uh, we were being paid to set aside 20% of our land. We were getting, we were getting uh, payments from the government for part of our crop based on what price we sold it at. And then in addition, we were getting storage payments to store corn for up to five years. There was that much, the demand for corn was that low, that there were that many incentives to keep the farmer alive. Uh, today, a lot of those programs are gone. Uh, biofuels created that market that tightened up the, the, the supply out there and worldwide supply and made farmers profitable. In fact, for about 10 years, there are very low subsidies to no subsidies for farmers. And uh, today we're excited about continuing to do that. If we can increase the percentage of ethanol in the gas tank as yields go up, because yields are ever increasing, they have been my entire lifetime, they have since the 1920s, yields have been going up and they're still going up. Uh, we need to take that extra yield, turn it into fuel and byproducts. Um, and, and uh, balance the supply and demand so the farmer has a fair price worldwide. If you want the farmer to farm cleaner, he has to be profitable. And biofuels tighten up the grain supply to make the farmer profitable so he can invest in, in nature conservancy. He can invest in buffer strips along waterways. He can invest in, in farming cleaner um, so that he can have a cleaner product. And hopefully long-term, these low carbon fuel standards and values in some of those states drive the farmer to farm cleaner as well. Which makes me take back my last comment that that was the last question. Um, let, let me ask one more and then I promise I'll let you go because I know you, you've got a very tight, busy schedule. Um, look into your crystal ball and you know where, where are biofuels in, in five years with a new, um, much more environmentally conscious um, administration that's hopefully offering wind to your back? Well, I think that we could hopefully, uh, with the backing of this administration, we, we hope they will stand strongly against the oil industry and with the biofuels industry. Hopefully we can be at E15 uh, within five years, which should dovetail nicely with increases in yield that are coming at us. Um, in addition, I think there's still potential for cellulose. Um, I'm not sure what form that's going to be. I'm not sure that's going to be biological or, or another means. But let's not forget that cellulose is the largest source of energy on the planet Earth that comes from the sun, not from below the surface of the Earth, that can be used to produce energy. And so I think you'll see more and more ways to use biomass, uh, to use this 1.3 to 1.5 billion tons annually we have that's going to waste uh, to produce fuel. And I think that that's, uh, that's going to dovetail also with the growth in, in ethanol production. So it's a pretty exciting future. Uh, for agriculture. Um, I'm not sure they see it yet. I hope they're starting to see it, but I think it's a very exciting future for agriculture. Well, with having you out there telling them about it, uh, hopefully they'll see it sooner than later. And, and thank you for everything that you and everybody at POET is doing for me as an individual, um, us as an industry of, of agriculture and the world. Thank you for joining us today on Farm Food Facts. You bet. Thanks, Phil. Great to talk to you. For more on all things food and agriculture, please visit us at usfarmersandranchers.org. 
Also, be sure to look out for us on Facebook at U.S. Farmers and Ranchers and on Twitter at USFRA. Until next time.